So you've all seen Deadpool 2, right? Looking at the box office numbers, I'm gonna assume you have. And that means that you're already familiar with the character of Cable to some extent. He's an old man from the future who loves guns and is all business. But the version of Cable we saw in Deadpool 2 is very much a distilled interpretation of Cable. Dumb steps on pussies. And in an era where superhero movies are trying to hew closer to their comic book source material than ever, seeing a character get stripped down and reimagined to such an extent can be a little disappointing. But as a creative decision, it's understandable. Because despite being a recent creation compared to most other Marvel staples, Cable is a character with a complicated and dense in-universe history. Let me give you the short version. Cable's real name is Nathan Summers, and he's the son of X-Men Cyclops and Jean Grey. Except Jean Grey isn't actually his mother, that honor goes to Madeline Pryor, an identical clone of her made by Mr. Sinister. But of course, Cable is a lot older than Cyclops and Jean Grey, and that's because he's a time traveler from the distant future. But it's not like young Nathan grows up in the present and Cable travels back in time from sometime in the late 21st century. Instead, he traveled forward in time all the way to the 39th century and grew up there. This is because he got kidnapped and infected with something called the techno-organic virus at one point, and the only hope for a cure is in the far-flung future. This is why Cable has a metal arm, by the way. It's a robotic virus, not just a cybernetic implant. The techno-organic virus is very dangerous and constantly threatens to swallow Cable whole, so he has to use his extremely powerful telekinetic mutant abilities to keep it at bay. Now, just because Cable spent his formative years in the future doesn't mean he couldn't be raised by his parents. Mother Ascani, who is an alternate universe version of Cable's sister, at one point pulled Cyclops and Jean Grey's consciousnesses into the future, where they nurtured Cable under the pseudonym Slim and Red, which are spelled like this for some reason. Besides saving him from the techno-organic virus, Cable was also brought into the future because he was prophesized to become the one to put an end to the evil mutant Apocalypse's reign, Apocalypse being the one who infected Cable with the virus in the first place. Cable beat him eventually, and then traveled back in time to prevent Strife, an identical clone of himself, from altering the timeline any further. And that's roughly where his first appearance in the New Mutants 87 picks up. Cable has been depowered, repowered, had his powers burn out, and then regain a slightly different power set. He was actually cured of the techno-organic virus at one point, but it came back to literally haunt him not too long ago. He's also been de-aged, re-aged, de-aged again, re-aged again, and only a few months ago he was actually killed by his own younger self, who is now just hanging around in the Marvel Universe as if that was no big deal. <laughs> so, you know, maybe not the kind of character who would say, You got 30 seconds, you jabbering butt plug. Or maybe he is. I think part of the appeal of long-running superheroes is their narrative plasticity. And Cable as a narrative agent has been used in a lot of different ways. He's been both a guerrilla warfighter whose only special attribute is a metal arm that's good for punching things, and an ultra-powerful, self-appointed messiah figure whose primary goal was to create a safe haven for mutants. And this vast spectrum of interpretations of Cable has made for a surprisingly large amount of quality stories, one of which is actually so good that I think it's my favorite Marvel comic of all time. I'm talking about the 2008 25-issue series Cable Volume 2. Written by Dwayne Trzinski and illustrated chiefly by Ariel Olivetti, Cable's second ongoing solo series is an interesting one because people don't really talk about it anymore. And that's strange, seeing as it's tied directly to a lot of beloved as well as infamous storylines from the 2000s. It effectively serves as the middle volume of a trilogy, bookended by two massive Marvel events, House of M on one side and Avengers vs. X-Men on the other. And by extension, it's a piece of one of the biggest long-term Marvel storylines ever, the near extinction of mutants and the arrival of a mutant savior. But despite all that, this series has kind of been lost and forgotten, swept under the rug like so many banal mid-2000s miniseries. And if you ask me, that's a shame, because I think this book is really, really good and deserves to be remembered as a classic, a bright spot in what was otherwise a deeply ill-conceived storyline. So let's take our time and explore what makes Cable Volume 2 such a good series, because there's quite a lot to like about it, and I would like it if, after all this time, this book got some more eyes on it. Let's start at the beginning, the story going into the story. At the end of House of M, Scarlet Witch used her reality-altering powers to depower almost all mutants in existence, as well as ensuring that no child would ever be born with a mutant gene again. In effect, all mutants lost their powers except for all of the bankable ones. You know, Wolverine, Cyclops, Storm, they all kept their powers. With the exception of Magneto, Professor X, and Quicksilver, the so-called decimation didn't really affect any notable characters, or at least not on an individual level. 
Now flash forward a few years to the Messiah Complex storyline and a new mutant activation is detected, which the X-Men soon discover to have come from a baby. As multiple different parties scramble to find this baby, time travel expert Forge finds out that at the moment the baby was born, the timeline splits into two directions. Multiple man sends a duplicate of himself into both timelines, and later on we find out that the baby ends up becoming a major player in both of them. In one, she kills a million people, leading to the mass persecution and imprisonment of mutants, while in the other she becomes a mutant messiah, uniting all of mankind and mutant kind. It turns out that the baby is with Cable, who traveled back in time from the more positive of the two futures. Fellow X-Man Bishop, meanwhile, has seen the worst of the two futures and is dead set on getting rid of the baby. Some more fighting occurs, after which Cyclops decides to let Cable take care of the baby in the hopes of ensuring a good future for her and, by extension, the whole world. An angered Bishop attempts to shoot Cable, who time slides into the future, and a shot hits Professor X instead. We then see Cable appear in a nondescript place in an undisclosed time, and that's about where our story begins. But of course, Cable Volume 2 is still a superhero book, so things aren't going to be as peaceful as this final panel implies. In the series proper, we quickly find out that the future Cable and the baby have found themselves in is not a happy one. It's a post-societal mess, one global tragedy away from being a full-blown post-apocalyptic world. To make matters worse, Bishop is still in the picture too, relentlessly pursuing the pair in the hopes of finishing the baby off. So what we have on our hands here is something akin to Lone Wolf and Cub, a story about a hardened warrior attempting to make his way through a hostile world while protecting a largely helpless child. And stories inspired by or similar to Lone Wolf and Cub are nothing new. We've had works like The Road, as well as graphic novels like Road to Perdition, and also video games like The Last of Us. In fact, I think Sony might have a patent on these kind of stories nowadays. But what sets Cable Volume 2 apart from those other works is that it's less about nurturing a young ward and more about learning how to become a nurturing presence at all. Because think about it, Cable was basically a child soldier and all he's known his entire adult life is combat and superheroics. What's more, he's completely disconnected from people at large, both because he's a time traveler who has a much different perspective on the world than the people he interacts with, and because he has immense superpowers, which means he bears a much larger responsibility than most others. Before this story, Cable never had the opportunity to live like a normal person because he always stood above them for better or worse. Now, even though Cable continues to operate in a violent area, he also has to learn a complicated but essential human skill, raising a child. And the contrast between Cable's hyper-competence in the field of combat and his complete lack of experience as a caretaker is spotlighted really well in the first issue where, not long after arriving in the future, Cable is accosted by a group of grifter bandits. Despite his lack of weapons, Cable makes quick work of the group while his inner monologue talks us through his thought process. We get the sense that this is all routine to him, and we don't really see him express any emotions in this scene. No fear, no anger, nothing. Then immediately afterwards, Cable has to change the baby's diaper and we get his first notable change of facial expression in the entire issue, a look of disgust. It's sort of played for comedy, sure, but it does go to show just how much newer this experience is to Cable in comparison to getting into fights. One thing I especially like about the first few issues is how the baby is foregrounded against the rest of the events. Issue 2 features Cable and Bishop's first clash in the series proper and it's a really well utilized scene. The fight itself is very short, but it subtly reinforces the fact that the baby is both Cable's number one priority and the biggest point of friction in his life. Right at the start of the fight, Cable takes a shot to the arm and his first response is to note that the baby was not hit. I like this part because the core of what Cable is trying to tell us here is not told explicitly through words or even images, but through a combination of all that the reader sees. What is being conveyed here is that the life of the baby is more important to Cable than his own. And this could have just as easily been expressed literally through text. Cable's internal monologue could have said something like, Gotta protect the kid, no matter what it costs me. But instead, it's the combination of seeing Cable hurt and his inner monologue focusing on the child being safe that tells us what Cable's priorities are. And I think that was a really good little creative decision. And speaking of dialogue, even the speech bubbles themselves are put to good work in this scene. Despite the fact that we're looking at a life or death altercation with our protagonist hurt and on the back foot, it's the baby's screams that take up most of the page real estate, going so far as to cover multiple panels with a single speech balloon. It's a really elegant way of showing that, again, Cable is more perturbed by having to take care of a child than by having to fight for his own survival. 
This series is still an action comic through and through, and I think it speaks to how well the right information is foregrounded that the baby doesn't feel like an afterthought. Since she can't say anything or impact the story in a major way, careless writing could very well have made her a lifeless MacGuffin, a role in which she could freely have been replaced by a magical gem or a really big cool gun that everyone wants to have. Thankfully, the comic goes to great lengths to make the baby feel like an actual character with emotions and needs. There are quite a lot of conversations and inner monologues sprinkled throughout the early parts of the series that aren't just about keeping the baby safe, but happy and healthy as well. There's this great moment where Cable wants to feed the baby cow milk and immediately gets scolded by the woman he's hunkered down with. Bishop also hilariously manages to track Cable by following a trail of discarded baby formula. Like, were those cans just plentiful even though society collapsed? I, I guess it makes sense. Not a lot of babies being born anymore, probably. Just as a side note, by the way, the first arc of this series is fittingly titled War Baby. This arc covers five issues, all of which are collected in the first trade. But for some reason, the first trade is called Messiah War instead of War Baby. Not really a big deal, all told, except for the fact that Messiah War is also the name of another storyline that occurs later on in this same series. This is the kind of thing that makes comic books seem so impenetrable to people. The third trade consists of two storylines, Too Late for Tears and Brood, and isn't named after either of them. So one could surmise from this that someone in Marvel thought it would be a bad idea to distance Cable too much from his badass action hero past, because they published multiple books that intentionally avoided tethering Cable to maternal or traditionally feminine ideas. You know, War Baby, No Tears Left to Cry, Brood, okay I'll admit that one's a bit of a stretch. And I'm not trying to call Marvel out or even say that this is a bad thing necessarily. I just think this speaks to how big of a leap the series was in Cable's characterization and that Marvel, aware of this, maybe wanted to cushion the whiplash a little bit. <clears throat> Going back to the topic of protecting the baby, in issue 4 Cannonball, one of the last surviving X-Men in this timeline makes an appearance. He dedicated his entire life to waiting for Cable to reappear, hoping to be able to do anything to help him and the baby. When the time comes and Bishop is hot on their heels again, Cannonball decides he's going to throw himself to the wolves to let Cable escape. And in his eyes, it's not even up for debate. The baby's safety is more important than his own life, so he won't let Cable tag along. And all of this is framed against panels of the baby smiling. So what we're being told here is that it's not just the baby's life that's worth preserving, but also her happiness and humanity. This is a lesson that Cable still needs to learn, however, as in the very next issue he builds this goofy protection harness for the baby, but leaves open an eye slit for her to witness all the carnage for some reason. Like I said earlier, becoming a good father figure is very much a process for Cable. A phrase of his that recurs multiple times in the first arc is, I'm a soldier. I'm trained for everything. Everything except this. This phrase is trotted out whenever Cable has to deal with the baby, usually right after getting into a fight. But by the end of the first arc, Cable starts believing in himself a little more. As he finally gets a chance to breathe, he says to himself, I'm a soldier, I'm trained for everything, maybe even this. And that's the nucleus of this entire series, really. It's about a character learning that they can be more than they are right now, learning that the life they lead has stunted them and that there's still room to grow. And coming off a full decade of stories portraying Cable as a martyr, a character who fights wars for others in part because that's all he knows how to do, this is a big step. And it's a step that's going to take some time for him to fully grow into. Which is something that the series communicates immediately by having Cable give the baby a handmade doll which has a fork for an arm. Like, you can't do that, that's dangerous, this baby's not even a year old yet. So yeah, Cable still has a long way to go as a parent, and this series does a really good job of taking us through the process. Cable Volume 2 consists roughly of five major storylines, all of which are either preceded by a time skip or have a time skip occur partway into them. First there's Cable's arrival in New Jersey, which is everything we've covered so far. Then he joins the secluded farming community of New Liberty while Bishop returns to the present, at which point the baby has grown up to play age. Then there's the crossover arc with X-Force in which Strife and Apocalypse make a reappearance, with the baby at a pre-adolescent age. Then an arc which is told mostly from her perspective as she escapes planet Earth with Cable in tow, which features a time skip in the middle and has her move from pre-adolescence to a teenager. And then there's the final arc back on Earth where she's grown up to be a young adult. I'm going to refer to the baby as Hope from now on because that's the name she's given at the end of the second arc, and I want to avoid having to use goofy constructions like with the baby at a pre-adolescent age again. So with the story taking place across a vast length of time, we get a really good look at how time and changes in environment affect Cable's execution of his role as a father. 
Because initially, he is only concerned with the baby as far as her health is concerned. She needs to be kept alive, and everything else is just gravy. But by the time he moves to New Liberty, things are changing. He's learning to be a bit more fatherly, playing with Hope and trying to comfort her. And he does the latter in a way that shows he's grown to be more aware that you can't always be blunt and straightforward with people, at least of all with kids. Even when things get serious and lives are at stake, Cable still tries to sugarcoat the situation to make things easier for Hope, although he doesn't always succeed. And just like with Sophie in New Jersey, Cable is partially beholden to the people of New Liberty for helping him develop in his role as a father figure. Most notably his wife, Hope, whom Cable later names the girl after. I'll call her Hope Senior from now on to avoid confusion. Cable and Hope Senior get into a really charming relationship, and you definitely get the sense that Cable becomes more personable as the years pass. The two of them are really cute together, and Cable actually manages to let his guard down a little around her. But he's still a warrior through and through, and his anxieties over what might be lurking right around the corner never leave him. When the President of the United States invades New Liberty, Cable is immediately ready for action. And while he's grown softer physically, his soldier mentality is still alive and well. He initially even shows willingness to abandon Hope Senior and the rest of the community and only decides to save them after Hope prods him about it. And when Hope Senior is eventually killed, it's sad not just because it's such an unnecessary loss of life, but also because it will inevitably cause some form of arrested development for both Cable and Hope. And it does, to no one's surprise. In the next arc, Hope starts to act out a little. She's not just frustrated with Cable's moment-to-moment -moment commands, but also with the world she's stuck in. Cable, meanwhile, is at his wit's end. He's getting old, he's physically exhausted, and even a soldierly grit isn't enough to stop him from losing Hope. Uh, not the girl, the concept of Hope. And while he's learned to be a bit more playful, both physically and verbally, it's clear that his parenting style is no longer adapting fast enough. Hope is slowly starting to think for herself, but Cable refuses to let up on his overprotective bodyguard routine. Hope is visibly upset by this, and during the Messiah War crossover arc, Cable almost loses her to Strife, who shows, or rather pretends to show, a willingness to talk to Hope like she's a grown-up. It's only the reveal of his true intentions that ends up bringing her back around. But where the situation really comes to a head is in the next arc, where Cable's condescension leads to the two getting separated and remaining apart for a good two years. Hope matures a lot during these two years, which goes to show just how much Cable had been babying her before then. And with the two of them now so far into the future that the Earth is on the verge of dying, they find salvation not through Cable's soldierly ingenuity, but through the connections Hope has managed to make. The entirety of the Too Late for Tears and Brood arcs is narrated by Hope's newfound boyfriend Emil from an unclear point in the future. His narration makes it clear that his kinship to Hope has bred an undying loyalty to her and him, and it's this that ends up saving the day. Cable, meanwhile, decides to stick to his old techniques of big guns and strong right hooks. And while, yeah, it's wild seeing him kill a giant space whale from inside its stomach, that alone won't solve their predicament. At this point they're out in space, they have nowhere to go, and Bishop is once again hot on their heels. It's Emil's willingness to surrender his own life for the sake of Hope's well-being that gets them off the spaceship safely. And until push comes to shove, Cable is unwilling to accept Emil's sacrifice. He won't allow anybody to be a martyr except for himself. The journey back to Earth takes another two years, and it's only in this final storyline that Cable at last shows willingness to trust Hope and put his life in her hands from time to time. And that might seem natural, seeing as she's almost an adult by this point, but Cable has spent so many years either apart from her or unconscious that this really amounts to a big step on his part. This final arc really is incredible. It's a five issue long race to the finish with Cable and Hope finally able to travel back in time again and Bishop making his final desperate attempt to kill Hope and finish his mission. And it's only through Cable and Hope's collective aptitude that the two of them are able to stay safe until the very end. And as they finally return to the present, the main thing to note is that nominally, Cable has failed his mission. Hope did not end up having a normal childhood. Not entirely his own fault, of course, but it is abundantly clear that he didn't turn into the parental figure Cyclops thought he could be. But that's actually what I like most about this story. Cable becomes a better parent as the story goes on, but it's a process with peaks and valleys. Every now and then he made some really good calls on how best to raise Hope, but all throughout the story there are these moments of real boneheadedness that set him and Hope back, but that's real and human. Parenting can be a real trial and error process, and Cable wasn't always perfect. Maybe in the end he didn't even do that good of a job, but he definitely learned something and grew in certain ways. And for a superhero comic book character in such a short span of time, that's really great. A Cable storyline about emotional growth, isn't that something? 
And so far, I focused almost entirely on relationships, and that might have left you with one big question. Does Cable still blow shit up? And the answer is actually yes. <laughs> Character development aside, Cable Volume 2 is still one hell of an action series, but the action isn't quite framed in the way you might expect. You know, even though Cable has been an action hero since his inception, writers have often vacillated on what kind of action hero he should be. For a long time, Cable ran the gamut between being a vigilante who enjoys the mere act of combat, uh, think Revy from Black Lagoon, and being more of a warrior poet. This discordant characterization can be seen as early as Cable's first solo appearance in Cable Blood and Metal, which features both Cable telling his crew, But don't forget to have some fun too, while destabilizing Iran, and him philosophizing in a Swiss condo while wearing dad sweaters. Which is to say nothing of the endless internal monologuing in that series. But what we see here is a very consistent approach to action, and one that I think suits Cable best. In Cable Volume 2, whenever Cable is the instigator of violence, it's quick and meticulous. He's not out to have fun and get into protracted scraps, he just wants to do what needs to be done. And because of this, most fights that Cable starts begin and end in a single page. It's difficult to even call most of them fights, really, they're more like assassinations. And Cable picks his assassinations very carefully, too. He is protecting someone, after all, so it wouldn't make sense for him to go in guns blazing at every opportunity. Conversely, fights that Cable gets caught up in tend to be more sustained affairs. They go on for multiple pages at a time and can be quite grueling. These are usually not so much about defeating or killing the opponent as they are about escaping. And it's in these fights where Cable ends up resorting to his most extreme measures. Hell, he ends up taking care of Bishop once and for all by breaking his time sliding mechanism and sending him to a point in the future so far ahead that the atmosphere on Earth has become completely unlivable. That's hardcore. And I think this is the ideal way to portray Cable as an action hero. In this series, he is a wary soldier who is all about efficiency in combat. The name of the game is still Big Guns, Big Guns, and Explosions, but it's all much more purposeful than in most gunmetal grey comic books. I think that really helps heighten the tension of the fight scenes in this series and make them feel a little more down to earth. Before moving on to the rest of the characters, I want to quickly rewind all the way to the first issue of this series to talk about the elephant in the room, the artwork. As you've no doubt observed, the early issues of Cable Volume 2 don't look like your average superhero comic. I mentioned at the start of this video that these issues were illustrated by Ariel Olivetti, and that wasn't entirely truthful. Olivetti was the artist for most of the first 15 issues of the series, yes, but he didn't illustrate them. Traditionally, the person credited as the artist, illustrator, or what have you of a comic is the one who draws all the panels using pencils. These drawings are then inked, flatted, and colored by different artists. Ariel Olivetti's artistic process diverges from the standard, however. He uses a lot of 3D models as reference for his pencil work, then he shades his basic pencil work, which he then uses as a basis for his coloring and texturing. Sort of like Alex Ross's work, but with 3D models instead of human ones. This process results in highly detailed and artistically consistent portraits of characters. And that might sound like an objectively good thing, but this style can be rather hit or miss. I quite like it myself, but I personally know a handful of people who aren't fond of Olivetti's works, and I'm sure that opinion is hardly uncommon. But I am very fond of Olivetti's work, not only here, but in other series as well. And I would argue that it works in the series' favor. The main reason for this is the breadth and detail of the facial expressions that Olivetti puts to page. Cable isn't the most physically expressive character, and neither is Bishop for that matter, so if you're given the task of doing the art for a comic starring them, you really have to show your mettle. When characters by design have such a little range, it can be difficult to convey the subtle facial movements that make for changes in expression. Take a look at any random issue from the original X-Force or Cable series, and you can see this problem in action. Odds are Cable will either be scowling or screaming, and the shape these expressions take will be roughly the same throughout. Ariel Olivetti's work, on the other hand, makes for a much wider variety in aspect. We see Cable pondering, expressing distrust, grimacing, looking overwhelmed, being surprised, losing consciousness, feeling hopeless, being completely shocked, having difficulty processing things, worrying, feeling melancholic, being utterly tired, being slightly uncomfortable, expressing pride, the list really goes on. There is even a fair variety in the way Cable's default scowl is put to page. And all of these expressions are executed perfectly. You can tell what they are trying to convey at a glance. That might sound like a given, but comic book artists do struggle with this from time to time. 
Penciling a comic book usually means working on a tight schedule and corners almost always have to be cut, and sometimes those corners are facial expressions. Issue 6 of this series is a good example of this. Part of this issue follows Cyclops and Emma Frost in the present, which is drawn by a guest artist. And while the art is hardly bad, it doesn't always correctly complement the dialogue. For some of these expressions, it's hard to imagine what emotions they're meant to convey or what is being said. For others, it is clear what they're meant to convey, but it just doesn't look right. This is a problem that Olivetti's artwork consistently avoids, and I think that's a major plus for this comic. It's also really commendable that characters look good regardless of their prominence. When you use 3D models as a base for your character art, that means a lot of labor is front-loaded because making 3D models is really time-consuming. With that in mind, it's amazing that characters who appear for no more than a handful of panels still come out looking perfectly acceptable. This page from issue 2 is a good example. These two panels make up 100% of Forge's appearances in this entire series, and yet he looks pretty good. He's clearly not as detailed as Cable or Bishop, but he does the job and then some. But there are also downsides to Olivetti's art, I must add. And that's only natural considering his artistic process. Because he's a painter and not a penciler, that means he is essentially his own colorist as well. So something has to give there, and most of the time that comes down to backgrounds and inorganic objects. His backgrounds are 3D modeled as well, but it's clear that they don't get the same amount of love that the characters do most of the time. Unless the environment is the focal point of a panel, it will usually consist of unembellished 3D models with at best a filter on top of them. This works better for some environments than others. Synthetic areas like laboratories or metal hallways tend to look better than plains or forests. If you want to see an example of Olivetti being hired against his strengths, give the Green Lantern Space Ghost crossover special a look. Most of it takes place on the outskirts of a forest and it doesn't always look appealing. But since Cable Volume 2 mostly takes place in ruined areas or wastelands, it's not too bad. What can get pretty bad, admittedly, are static objects. Huge guns are of course a Cable staple, so they do tend to get some work put into them, but everything else is a crapshoot. The very worst example, in my opinion, is a page from issue 3, which is just three panels of a car falling onto Cable, and it looks dreadful. The model of the car is low on details, and it's lit in the most unflattering way imaginable. Keep in mind that these issues came out in 2008. 3D modeling tech still had some ways to go at the time. So the artwork is a balance of good and bad, and whether the scales are tipped in favor of the positives or negatives is really in the eye of the beholder. But in my opinion, Olivetti's artwork really pays off, and I think he was the right choice for this book. But of course, he wasn't the only artist on this series, so let's give the others lip service too. Issues 16 and 17 were illustrated by Paul Galassi, who was not the right pick for the storyline, if you ask me. He's not a bad artist. On the contrary, some of the pages in these issues look absolutely stunning. The problem is that these issues are centered around hope, and drawing young girls does not appear to be Galassi's specialty. She looks much too old in a lot of panels, and the shapes of her face and features are really inconsistent. The rest of the artwork is solid, with Gabriel Guzman and Jamie McKelvey both delivering quality work on their respective issues. That said, I do think the coloring work applied to their art does it no favors. In the 2000s, this kind of soft airbrushed approach to coloring was the norm for comic books, and while it's fine for some art styles, I think it really should not be used in tandem with low detail artwork that fears away from realism. If you look at McKelvey's artwork with the color and shading stripped away, you can see just how much of the geometry of the characters' faces and bodies that's implied by the coloring isn't actually meant to be there. This kind of mismatch between illustrations and colors really reinforces the flatness of the image, instead of working in tandem to make the image pop out. This is far less of a problem in the final story arc, where the artwork and coloring complement each other much more strongly. This is not something to be underappreciated either, because for some reason the final handful of issues is illustrated by a legion of artists. Like, why are there so many? Some issues have as many as five different artists credited to them, but it all looks good, so I've got nothing to complain about. And I've saved the best for last, actually, because the X-Force crossover issues? Wow. I love Olivetti's artwork, but Clayton Crane absolutely eats his and everyone else's lunch with his work here. Crane's artwork is stunning. His characters are super expressive, the level of detail in his art is unparalleled, I love his use of color and contrast, and it's all incredibly consistent. He did the art for nearly 25 full issues of X-Force, and it's amazing the whole way through. And like Olivetti, he's a painter more so than an illustrator, so he does his own coloring work too. I have no idea where he found the time to do all that. If you ever want to witness an utter feast for the eyes, I highly recommend reading the 2014 Rye series from Valiant Comics. 
Crane puts in even better work there than he did on X-Force, and the more vivid imagery of that universe allows his artwork to shine even brighter. But of course, what is artwork without a good story to guide it? Let's focus on the characters once more, this time with her eyes on Hope, arguably the real protagonist. In particular, I want to talk about how her environment affects her and how well the process of her growing up is portrayed. If we take a look at the second story arc, we can see that Cable's initial laissez-faire attitude towards raising Hope didn't really pay off. She's a little bratty when we first meet her play-age self, disturbing her sleeping parents and throwing tantrums when she doesn't get her way. Cable and Hope Sr. never talk about this directly, but Hope Sr. does berate Cable for how insufficient his parenting style had been before they met, talking very little, refusing to give Hope a name, and generally not acting like a real father would. So even though Cable and Hope have been taking refuge in New Liberty for a while, it seems Cable's parenting style hasn't really caught up to their new environment. That said, Hope has definitely been picking up a thing or two from her surrogate mother. In contrast to how she's portrayed later, Hope displays a lot of feminine characteristics in the storyline. She takes on a lot of demure poses, she smiles kindly when addressed, and she doesn't put on an act of bravery when the cockroach army shows up. She also says to Cable that he looks handsome at one point, and that can't be something she picked up all on her own. Now this video is a no bio truth zone, so I'm not going to sit here and tell you that Hope develops these characteristics just because she's a girl. Instead, I'd say these are all traits she picked up from Hope Senior over time, which is something that the rest of the series amply supports. Because once Hope Senior is out of the picture, Hope quickly starts to develop a different personality. Her childish, girlish sweetness makes way for more tomboyish qualities over time. She starts to act out more, she gets snarky from time to time, and she starts rocking a terrible haircut. She also develops a speech impediment, which she didn't have before, pointing to the fact that she doesn't get to do a lot of talking when Cable is her only company. She even says outright that she's picked up a lot from the Wasteland Straggler she and Cable were holed up with in between storylines, and then abrades Cable for thinking she doesn't notice and pick up on what's happening around her. It's great. One decision that I think was especially clever is that we never get to see things from Hope's perspective before this point. It's around this time in Hope's development where she starts thinking for herself, and using this opportunity to switch points of view from Cable over to her was a really good call. It's really interesting to see how Hope thinks about the world around her now that she's old enough to no longer take things as read. She begins to question all the inconsistencies in Cable's narrative about where he came from and what they're trying to accomplish. And while it's clear that she still loves him, she's getting tired of how untransparent he is. And during her time with X-Force, she begins to feel unheard on top of everything else. She no longer has Cable's undivided attention, and Cable refuses to let her in on all the grown-up talk, for lack of a better word. She's pushing back against Cable's emotional overprotectiveness, but he refuses to budge on it. There's this lovely page early on in the X-Force crossover that exemplifies this. Cable has a dream where Hope slips from his grasp and falls down a cliff, and she looks like she did in New Liberty when she was still innocent and ignorant of the dangerous post-apocalyptic world. She's seen the reality of the world by now, but Cable still refuses to give her the benefit of the doubt. And once the two get separated, we get a good look at just how much Hope has learned over the years. She's sensibly apprehensive, she is capable of defending herself, and all in all she does a pretty good job of staying safe. She's doing a better job of it than Cable even, who can't help but make himself a target while looking for her. When the two of them get together years later, Cable actually talks to her even more condescendingly than he did before, referring to himself by a pet name Hope hadn't used for him in a long time even before they got separated. And now that she's older and smarter, she actually manages to lay into Cable a little bit for keeping her so sheltered while also expecting her to be on her toes all the time. It's a shame that this conversation is cut short by the aliens attacking the ship, but it's a fantastic moment nonetheless. And it's only after this that Cable finally starts to treat Hope with some respect. When she mentions that she's killed one of the aliens, Cable compliments her for it instead of chiding her like he would have done in the past. He still doesn't trust her to fight her own battles, but at least he's willing to acknowledge that she's become quite competent in their time apart. And once they're back on Earth, the two finally settle into a more cooperative relationship. Hope even gets to fight her first real solo fight against Bishop while Cable is out of commission. She gets a chance to put everything she's gleaned from Cable to good use, which the series portrays by reincorporating a tactic from the very first issue. Though I do have to wonder who Hope learned this flip from. D did Cable teach her this? Because it has Lithe Femme Fatale written all over it, and I don't think that really suits his style. Either way, once the two of them get rid of Bishop, their roles have fully reversed. With Cable exhausted and injured, it's now up to Hope to get them to the right place to make the jump back to the present. 
And just as they do, Hope reflects on their time together once more, showing us that while Cable wasn't the ideal parent, he's still the one responsible for making her the person she is today. And to close the series out, Hope refers to Cable as Dad for the first time ever as they time slide back to the present. And I couldn't think of a better way to end this comic. Now, while Cable and Hope get a happy ending, Bishop most certainly does not. That's only natural, he is the villain of the series after all, but there is depth to him. And while his actions weren't entirely justified, his motivations were understandable. His journey throughout this series is a classic case of a just man being pushed to do horrible things out of the conviction that he's right. We don't know this going into the story, but the post-apocalyptic state of the world is actually his fault. Partway into the story, he gets kidnapped by the X-Men, and while being interrogated by Cyclops, the truth is revealed. Bishop is the one who destroyed the entire world, putting nukes, chemical weaponry, and bacteria to use to wipe out almost all of mankind. This might be one of the worst things anyone has ever done in the history of the Marvel Universe, so how could it possibly be justified? Well, it's simple. In his eyes, the future that Cable and Hope are stuck in is only real so long as Hope is alive. If he can get rid of her, all the horrific things he has committed will cease to have happened. And this isn't just rhetoric on his part, he is fully dedicated to this idea. There are multiple points in the story where he kills good people or even old friends without apology or a sense of remorse, reiterating that these versions of them don't exist as far as he's concerned. His own lifespan is of no concern to Bishop either. Early on, it is implied that he isn't just rapidly moving back and forward in time to find Cable, but spends a lot of time waiting for him, scouting out time periods in the hopes of tracking him and maybe even catching him unprepared. The entirety of the annual issue King-Sized Cable is dedicated to this kind of time trickery, with both Cable and Bishop devising traps and roadblocks for the other that stay effective for decades at a time. It's a rare example of an annual issue that is entirely skippable but still adds a ton of flavor to the story at large. But Bishop's dedication to his dreadful task does get the better of him eventually. He teams up with old enemies like Strife in the off chance of them killing Hope by accident even though he knows he can't really trust them. He also becomes obsessed with the idea of killing Hope in a way where he can see her die. In a way, it's almost perverse. He gets multiple opportunities at a surefire kill by means of a big explosive device, but he refuses to go for them because he won't be able to verify Hope's death. This despite the fact that he knows his current incarnation will cease to exist if Hope dies. And it's his unwavering dedication to killing Hope that eventually forces Cable to resort to terrible measures to take Bishop out. Someone does rescue him eventually though, so it's all good, right? And then the story comes to an end with those well-trodden words that conclude every good fairy tale, to be continued in X-Men's second coming. Like a lot of comic books, especially ones with short runs, Cable Volume 2 doesn't really have a narrative conclusion. There was no way it could have because it was part of a bigger story and editorial mandate had it that that story was to be led into. That's the nature of the beast. But the ending still manages to be satisfying because thematically, the story has wrapped up all of its loose ends. The core characters have all finished their developmental arcs and the main theme of Cable learning how to be a father figure has been fully resolved. It's a lot less finishing the fight and a lot more you're going to carry that weight, if you catch my drift. And I think if you have to pick between resolving themes and resolving a narrative, the former is the more satisfying option, especially in superhero comics where the story is never truly over anyway. And that's an approach to writing I would like to see applied more often to short-lived comic books. Something I see again and again when comics are faced with cancellation is a rush to complete the current story arc, with a lot of the long-term character development being left half-finished, most likely to be abandoned by the next writer to pick those characters up. But this series, on the other hand, that's an ending that really does it for me, even though it's not much of an ending at all. So there you have it. Cable Volume 2 is a real gem, and I love it dearly. And the main message I sort of hope to send with this video is that there's a bit more to Cable than he's often given credit for. He hasn't been a gun-toting, shouty badass for a long time, and a lot of people don't know that because that's the image of him that people were sold when comics were at their most relevant. But I would really like it if Cable's status quo were to move a bit further away from that. Because the thing with Marvel, and I guess big two comic books in general, is that they love reverting characters back to the status quo to get old eyes back on the product. But Cable has grown to be so much more interesting since he was first created that moving him back to his status quo again and again means constantly derailing his character for the worse. I would like it if the public perception of Cable could shift from being a pouty warhawk to a more thoughtful, weary soldier. Because if that's what Cable is known for, that's the direction Marvel will push for him to develop in. 
I think that would be a lot better than hitting the reset button on him time after time and making him team up with X-Force over and over and over again. We've covered the entirety of the series in this video, but I think I've been vague enough in my description of the overall plot that you could still get a lot out of it if you were to give these issues a read. And I highly recommend you do. Just recently, Cable Volume 2 was reprinted in the form of two big paperbacks entitled Cable Last Hope. These also contain the crossover issues with X-Force, The Annual, and even a prequel miniseries focused on Bishop. The entirety of both Cable Volume 2 and X-Force Volume 3 are also available on the subscription service Marvel Unlimited, and of course it's all on Comixology as well. Here's a recommended reading order if you're going for either of the latter two options. Of course, all of that is assuming you're okay with giving money to one of the worst companies of all time, hashtag rehire James Gunn, hashtag fire John Lasseter, but I'll leave that up to you. I hope you got something out of this video, and if you're going to read Cable Volume 2, I hope you'll get something out of that too. Never seen a blue sky Yeah, I can feel it reaching out and moving closer That's something about blue Ask myself what it's all for Know the funny thing about it, I couldn't answer. No, I couldn't answer. Things are turning deeper, shade of blue. And images that might be real, maybe illusion. Keep flashing off and on. Just a dream, you know, that's never ending. 